estrogen dominance. So this term right here is pretty much like, this is, this is the term used to pretty much like encapsulate a whole host of symptomology, a whole host of symptoms that are relative towards hormone imbalances. That's the distillation of this. So all this stuff from mood swings to depression to insomnia, a disruption of circadian rhythms. You know what your circadian rhythms are? That's your sleep cycle, your biological clock, your biological sleep, sleep clock. Right? So when your things are just not working right, you have certain neurotransmitters, which are like brain hormones, that are not firing sequentially in sequence. Real quick on that, you know about serotonin, right? You've all heard about that, dopamine. Those are like the, 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 the popular ones, right? But there's a whole host of them. And in order for you to produce dopamine, you have to produce certain, certain um, precursors before you can get to that. So for example, amino acids. Amino acid therapy, free form amino acid therapy is very powerful for repairing the brain. Say for example, you've hit the coffee button too much, coffee, 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 you don't realize that there's certain, there's certain chemical pathways in the brain that are being um, inhibited simply because you've hit that button too much. Or you've done certain like recreational substances. You hit a button too many times, if it's a powerful stimulant, it starts to replace out your body's natural, we call endogenous production of certain chemicals that normally would help your body produce dopamine or produce serotonin or hormonally to produce progesterone or testosterone, so on and so forth, right? Um, so what happens with your circadian rhythms is that some of those neurotransmitters, or that one specifically called melatonin, which is known as like your sleep hormone, sleep neurotransmitter, it's at the very end of the serotonin chain, which is interesting. It's going to have, we're going to talk more about that, how that actually affects the hormone imbalance, that melatonin piece in particular. We'll get right back to that. Excessive weight gain, obesity or diabetes, which is basically called now. Like we, we don't even need two separate terms, we just lump them together because they're basically the same thing now, right? That's going to be a major part of this puzzle too. We're going to really, as we go through this, we're going to provide protocols, very loose protocols. It's things that are going to give you the full menu, the full buffet of what's been figured out about hormones and how to balance them and how to how to push out the toxic hormones, the toxic uh, mimics or imposters. It's a really good term. Toxic mimics, toxic imposters. Migraine headaches, fertility, infertility, low libido. That's a great one, right? The number one way you can gauge the number one barometer you can use to figure out, hey, do I have hormone imbalances? If, you don't, if you're not able to do a, a quick hormone panel test right away, then you can, you can use your experience as a gauge. Well, where's my, where's my libido at? Right? There's two different ways to do that. Either in the obvious sense, what does that look like? Right? And just like, okay, how do I feel about that? How does my body feel? That's the number one thing as a reproducing organism. A species that's no longer able to propagate itself is the number one sign of a species going extinct. Think about that. That's pretty important. It's all, it basically comes down to the hormonal sequence. Something in that, that ratio, something in that orchestra it's playing out of tune, but that can be fixed. And um, infertility, I mean, that's a major one. We live in a society right now that is 40 to 50% infertile. 
40 to 50 percent infertile. It's a pretty, pretty staggering statistic. Um, and then underneath this, oh yeah, and then this thing, all forms of cancer. All forms of cancer. One of the big parts of my work is progressing more and more into the cancer field. I talk about it all the time in all my lectures now, really getting into the details of it. What is cancer? What really is going on with cancer? What's the physiology of a cancer cell? What, what causes cancer? There's a lot of different kinds of cancer. Cancer's not just one thing. Cancer could be the, rooted as a viral infection. It could be a fungal infection. A lot of times, cancer is a viral and fungal con infection combined. And a lot of times, it's hormonally driven. So you have to factor that. If, if for me, if anyone comes to me and they have some form of cancer, or I'm even talking about it, we can't get away from that unless we talk about the hormonal component. If somebody had cancer, say, they came to me, they had some form of cancer regardless of what it is, but if it is specifically reproductive cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, right away I already know. I don't even need to know, I don't even need to know the details. I already know essentially what the trigger is. Now from there it's just figuring out how to, how to reverse engineer that. So, that's, so when you're dealing with something like that, then you need to get a full hormone panel test to figure out where the hormones are. That's going to be really important to just kind of like get an idea. After we go through all this information, right, after we go through everything, one of the things people think about is like, well, okay, where are my hormones at? I need to figure out where do I exist on that ratio? Because you could think things are all fine or... For most of us, something's off, right? We feel like something is off, so we could be like, oh, it's my thyroid. Oh, it's, it must be the, okay, my estrogens are going out of control. My progesterone, my cortisol, testosterone, DHEA. Now, it's one thing to think that, but it's another thing to get your panel tested and to be looking at it. You may think your vitamin D is totally good. We live in paradise. Where does vitamin D come from? It comes from the sun, right? In order to get the proper vitamin D3, D3 is the most bioactive form of it. D2 comes from like mushrooms, like shaga mushroom or uh, agaricus bisporus, which is like a budden mushroom which apparently is actually a bad estrogen blocker. Agaricus bisporus, I just, like, I just like that name. That's like the budden mushroom. It's apparently, it, it, it opposes bad estrogen accumulation in the body. Go figure, right? But vitamin D3 comes directly from the photon rays of the sun. Very important to just get that very clearly. Because vitamin D as a hormone is the most powerful of them all. It turns on all the hormones. If you think of like in your house, you have a light switch, right? Turns off the lights in a room or maybe a section in the room. That's like maybe the Garagus bisporus. Like combating one section. Okay, you have estrogen accumulation here. It's pushing out your progesterone. It's pushing out your testosterone. So like, it's, it's kind of like, okay, it's helping that little section of the puzzle. But vitamin D is like the, the big data, or what do you call the Frankenstein, Frankenstein switch. It turns off the whole house, potentially the whole neighborhood. That's vitamin D. That's how powerful it is. If you have vitamin D where it needs to be, it'll turn on all the cancer-fighting genes. It turns on more genetic triggers of healing than anything else that's ever been discovered by far. Just so you know, it's free. <laughs> totally free. But you have to absorb it. You have to get enough of it. 
We'll talk a little more about that. Estrogen dominance is a term that was coined by um, a man named Dr. John Lee. Some of you may have remembered the books like What Your Doctor Doesn't Tell You About Menopause. No, there's like, oh, there's like a whole famous litany of these, these books from back in like the 80s that were republished from his original uh, research in like the 60s and 70s. And basically he's famous for really coining the term estrogen dominance because he had all these menopausal women that were just having all these imbalances show up at his doorstep, be like, look, I, I'm taking these hormone replacement therapies and it's throwing things out of whack and I don't know what to do. And he found out by giving them natural progesterone cream, bioidentical progesterone cream, that all their hormonal fluctuations started to normalize and even out. Yam-based progesterone cream. And then that's where he figured out it's an estrogen toxicity. It's an estrogen storm, essentially, that's throwing everything out of balance. Right? So, how does that happen? What are the causes of estrogen toxicity? The first thing is environmental pollution. Environmental pollution, there's three things. There's three things that happen. I'll just streamline real quick here. There's three reasons that our, our hormones go out of sync. Remember, it's a, it's a ratio. It's a sequence that they all perform in. They go out of sync, A, because env environmental pollution. That's the number one thing that's happening to us right now. Plastics. Plastics is not number one. Plasticizers, phthalates, PCBs. It's why I personally can't like touch fish. Not because my vegetarian ideals won't allow it. I kind of let that go. I am a vegetarian, but I, I do actually enjoy fish. But now it's like I can't even go near it. Just because of what I know. Because of mercury toxicity, radiation toxicity, and because of plastic toxicity. I was like, oh geez, okay. I'm going to have to close the door on that one. So, um, that's one thing. In plastic bottled water, that's the big one. That's the big one. I prophetize about this all the time. Because if we can get on that, if we can understand what water is, water is a solvent. It's the most powerful solvent. And what's a solvent? A solvent is a thing that creates a solution. A solution dissolves the problem, creates a solution. Water is always the solution, by the way, to anything. You have a problem, you have a headache, you have some kind of digestive issue, you have like irritable bowel syndrome, you have constipation. Water. Water's the number one thing. Water and salt is the number one thing. Always, before anything. Anyone remember that book, uh, Rise for Water? Right? Dr. Batman Galage? His whole thing was water. Water, water, water. But then he came to realize, actually, it's not just water. Because your body isn't just a water tank. It's not just like a, uh, like a swamp. Because if you just drink water and you're too watery, like you're too yin, like a Chinese medical perspective, you're too yin, you end up feeding organisms that thrive in a dark, swampy environment. You know what I'm saying? Like fungal infections. Like I bet you, if you look at the blood chemistry of a lot of certain cancers that are fungally related, you will see that kind of thing go on. So he figured out, actually, you need water and salt because we're like an ocean inside. And the salt holds the water to our tissues. So instead of drinking water and then it's like sloshing around in your stomach, he was had that experience. Just like... <laughs> that's not normal. It should immediately go right into your tissues. And feel hydrated. You know what it's like when you feel hydrated. And you could be drinking water all day long, all day long, all day long, but then it's just like going through you. That's not normal. Water and salt. For the adrenal glands, your adrenals, your battery pack, runs on sodium. It's, it's like folk wisdom. 
This has always been known. This is why salt has such a reverence in so many ancient cultures. Animals, by the way, will seek out salt naturally. They found out that if you feed migrating animals magnesium supplements, they'll change their migration patterns and they'll stop, they'll stop going over to the ocean to get the salt licks. It's minerals. First and foremost, being properly mineralized. So salt is actually a natural mineral supplement. Because it has every known mineral and potentially minerals that aren't known. Right? That do certain other things to our brain. So that's really important to just kind of get. One liter of water in the morning with one fourth teaspoon of sea salt. Sea salt specifically. Put that out there. But when you drink water that's in a plastic bottle, what does it taste like? It tastes like plastic. Is that plastic flavoring? Like plastic stevia? No. That's, that's pla that is literally, you know what they do in the plastic industry? Now it's one thing if they blew the plastic up for like say a year and then left it there before they put the water in. But that's not what happens, is it? They blow the plastic up and immediately pour all the water in and then leave it underneath LED lighting, artificial lighting. And that plastic, we know as an environmentally, is not biodegradable. That's one thing. But the environmentalists don't even realize that it's photodegradable. So those light penetrations are actually causing more plastic or plastic particulates to, to uh, leach into that water even more. Right? That's why you don't actually do herbal infusions in plastic. You do it in glass. Go on about that for a while, but you get the point. So what the plastic actually does, and what all these chemicals here do, they're xenoestrogens. Xenoestrogens, really important term to know about. Xeno or fake. Fake estrogens. So this is one of the big aspects that's happening to the body right now biochemically is that certain compounds are getting stuck in our hormone receptors, in our estrogen receptors. And those, those mimicking, those toxic mimics, those toxic imposters estrogen imposters are getting stuck in the estrogen receptors and they start turning on. And it starts causing your body to overproduce estrogen, over to produce estrogen until you have an estrogenic storm. There's a term called gynecomastia. Has anyone heard of that? Who's ever heard of that term? Gynecomastia. And there needs to be more men in this group right now. It's basically a feminization of the man. Now we hear about that a lot, right? Like, oh, there's a, there's a movement to feminize the men. Which I totally believe. But people don't realize actually how far that's going. Is that you see men that have boob formations. Male breasts. Google it. Right? And what is that? that is, when you examine that tissue, it's all estrogenic formation that's causing that. We'll go deeper into what that is, how you can block that, how you can change that whole situation. It shows up for women too, very similarly, like in the adipose tissue, the fat tissue, like right here, right up in this area, the lower back, obviously the breast tissue and the back of the arms. You all know, you all know these things better than I do, but that's essentially the same kind of thing. So that feminization of the man is an interesting phenomenon. There's a, lot of, there's a certain doctor named Dr. William Wong. He's very, he's, you check him out. He's got some really interesting information on this. He thinks that the, the, the feminization, the, 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 the behavioral feminization, because a lot of women will be like, you know, men just don't seem like men anymore. Like, where are all the real men? Like, kind of like the alpha male kind of idea, like everyone's like beta. Like, you know, whatever happened. 
And I'm, I'm here to tell you that very possibly, it's not just a psychological. It's a biochemical affecting the mind. The connection that I made first, you are what you think about, you are what you eat. If we don't get to the body first, we're not, going, we're not ascending anywhere. Right? We can't just be disembodied praying to divine light in a closet or whatever on the mountain. We actually have to be grounded in our body, fully fortified, fully sovereign, liberated in this vehicle before we're getting anywhere. 